from the nation's capital, this is the Fly Fishing Consultant Podcast with your host, Rob Snowett. My name's Rob Snow White. This episode is going to be all about fish slime. This podcast is going to break up the interviews I've been doing over the last couple of months because I finally had time to sit down and record this one. I've been busy tying shad flies and building a website for my Trout Unlimited chapter. That URL is novatu.org. Nova TU. And if you need some shad flies, please go to my website and get them while supplies last. I've been tying them by the hundreds the last couple of weeks. So if you want to get some, get them while I still have materials. So I'm breaking up my podcast and throwing this one in because I want to give you fresh novel content almost each week. And I've been doing a lot of interviews with other people. So I thought I'd throw in one of my educational podcasts. This podcast is about fish slime, also known as mucoprotein coatings or immunological defenses in fish skin. We know handling fish is detrimental to their health. Holding fish, unfortunately, is part of fishing that we all are guilty of. I'm guilty of it too. But how much do we know about fish slime? What is it? How does it work? What really happens when we remove it? And for those people that use the hashtag keep them wet on social media when your fish is out of the water, you're not doing yourself any justice. You're just as guilty as everyone else. If the fish is not in the water, it's not really wet. And the use of rubber nets in recent years is an attempt to do less harm to fish. But how much do we really know about the damage caused by nets? We know that the old nylon ones are more abrasive than rubber, but doesn't hard rubber or Silicon just act as a squeegee and scrape off the fish slime as the fish moves back and forth through the net. So I set out to research some of these things. And the reason I'm doing all this is from an Instagram post I made steelhead fishing last fall. I'm holding a fish while wearing gloves. I'm only holding the fish with my fingertips of my thumb and index finger. So it looks like the whole hand may be covering the fish. Somebody mentioned in a comment about not wearing gloves while holding fish. And I'm absolutely behind that. When I'm wearing gloves, I try not to have the glove touch the fish. I try to remove my gloves when I can, but does a wet hand do any less damage than a bare dry hand or glove? And does the material of the glove itself harm the fish more than not wearing one? Could fleece be less damaging than your skin? What about wool? or latex, what does the actual frictional base of the material do to fish slime? There was also an Instagram post about a sick fish spotted in Colorado. The person posting the image just assumed the fish was caught by a fly angler and was handled by somebody wearing gloves, and that fish was sick and covered with all sorts of grossness because of an angler not keeping the fish wet. Now, you can't just assume that a sick fish is caused by somebody handling a fish. You can't assume that the person was wearing gloves when they're holding that fish. I don't remember who posted it, but I decided to sit down and research some of this. So did someone handle that fish? It's hard to tell unless there was actual damage seen on the fish. Would that leave a hand-shaped leisure where noxious organisms can infiltrate the fish and cause harm? We don't know. We don't know if that fish was sick specifically from handling. So I set out to investigate the detrimental effects of handling fish, but didn't really end up answering a lot of the questions. Two of the main questions I had, which I could not answer, were, how long does it take for a fish to replace slime once it is removed? We know how long it takes for our epidermis to replace itself in the various layers of our skin, but we don't know how long, or I couldn't figure out, how long does it take to produce fish slime? And then how long does it take to reproduce it once it's been removed? There's no information of the amount of slime produced. I have information based on species and some of the amount they produce, but there's no amount of actual slime where maybe somebody removed the slime off of a fish and weighed it and then put it back in water and then reweighed it later. I don't know. A lot of the information I was looking for brought me to aquarium websites about 
fish slime and the acidity and different qualities of the water the fish are in and the handling of those fish. Didn't get to as much scientific documents on the internet as I wanted to. You can email me if you want copies of my notes with all of the URLs where I garnered the information. The carp episode was sent to a gentleman in Australia because he wanted to find out more about the most detrimental introduced fish to his continent. This is not a podcast on how to handle fish. This is going to be another science-based educational podcast, and it may not be for all my listeners. For those of you that do decide to stick around, you're going to find all sorts of interesting information that you would most likely never encounter. So I'm doing the hard work for you. This is information you can share with your friends on the stream or at a dinner party. Who knows? And just to say straight up that the term safe fish handling, it's an oxymoron. There really is no safe way to handle a fish. So this is episode 224. In this episode, I'm going to go into introduction, the background of fish slime, what is fish slime, where is the slime found, where is the slime made, and then seven functions of fish slime, reducing drag, osmoregulation, protection, feeding, nest building, cement, and then intraspecific chemical communications and interspecific chemical communications. So let's start with the intro. What happens before we handle a fish? We've already pierced that fish's flesh with some sort of steel. That fish has been dragged through the water against its will and then depleted of its energy reserves needed for reproduction, feeding, digestion, hiding, and overall protection of itself. That fish has been misplaced back into its home water. Where we caught it is most likely not where that fish is being put back. And sometimes fish are brought up from various depths and they can't get back down because their air bladder may not be functioning due to quickly bringing the fish up. You'll see this in deep water fish where their eyeballs and their bladders explode. If it's cold out, the fish's eyes and gills are probably additionally going to freeze. If it's cold enough for your guides to be freezing on your rod, it's most likely that fish is going to freeze when it comes out of the water. When I'm holding those steelhead in the winter, when I'm holding those fish in the wintertime, or when it's snowing and cold, I'm holding my fingertips against their operculum or their gill cover, keeping it closed so only cold air is going into the mouth or around the eyes. I'm trying to do the least amount of damage to the damage I'm already doing to the fish. So then the fish gets handled. Is it dropped in the boat? Does it bang off of rocks? Does it scrape against your hands? Whatever goes on, that fish is flopping around. It's trying to get back to its environment. It's not safe. And then you think of the chondrichthians, the organisms that don't have hard bones in their body, sharks, rays, and skates, or if somehow you catch a chimera on the fly. These organisms are not made to be supported out of water. They don't have a rib cage covering their internal organs. So any sort of any sort of banging of the fish, dropping it, can severely damage internal organs. All the way to that organism is on their internal organs when you bring them out. Conversely, we also have a meme that I don't know who created that shows a largemouth bass being held by its lower mandible. And it says like, don't be a jerk. Fish can't be held like this. You're putting all the weight on the lower jaw and the hinge on the jaw to the skull. Now, there's no scientific basis for that. Why do people keep posting that one image when there's other things that we do to a fish that we know are wrong, yet that one still seems to make its way around social media with no background information or research to support it. So the fish has been handled. Then we return the fish exhausted and scared to its home while it's still in pain. Now, all fish have these body coverings in some indication of their importance. Some fish have more slime, some have less. Fish live in an aquatic environment, which is ideal as a medium for microorganisms to grow on them compared to an organism that lives on the air. Now, with either too much or too little of the slimy coat, any fish will die. Let's talk about the background of fish slime. Fish skin is the main surface of gas exchange in exchange with water between the fish and their surrounding environment. The synthesis and secretion of a functional surface mucus layer first arose in the cnidarians, we know those as jellyfish, and the tenophores, the corals. 
This aids in the excretion and cleaning of the organism. Now, teleost fish or raid fin fishes are the most primitive vertebrates where dedicated antibodies specific to mucosal surfaces have been characterized. In teleosts, the gut, the skin, and the gill are the main mucosal surface and immune barriers. Due to its lack of keratinization, teleost skin possesses living epithelial cells in direct contact with the water or aqueous medium in which they live. Fish skin mucus functions like our digestive tract. The amount of mucus produced by fish is related to the external characteristic amount of the fish scales. Fish with naked skin produce more slime. Think of a catfish. Heavily scaled fish have less slime. Think of maybe a largemouth bass. Stress conditions, handling, confinement, food deprivation, exposure to toxic substances can all change the mucus production and composition in fish. What exactly is slime? Well, fish slime is made from mucus. Mucus contains substances called mucins, which are a type of glycoprotein, which is a protein with attached carbohydrates. The mucus gel matrix is primarily comprised of O glycosylated proteins called mucins. It also contains a diverse array of other molecules such as proteins, structural proteins and immune-related proteins, and antimicrobial peptides and proteins, lipids, which are fats, and smaller molecules such as crinotoxins. Crinotoxins are just toxins that are produced by specialized poison gland but are merely released into the environment, usually by means of a pore. Mucus is 95% water. And the protein molecule in mucin is attached to many carbohydrate molecules. Mucins rapidly form a gel when they leave goblet cells and contact water. They're responsible for both the viscous and the elastic properties of the mucus coating the fish's skin. Now, glycol proteins produced in the epidermis combine with water to create a mucus. Fish slime contains other substances besides mucin and water, including enzymes, antibodies, and salts. And then you have mycosporine-like amino acids, which are produced by organisms that specifically live in environments with high volumes of sunlight, usually marine environments. Think of these as your coral reef fishes. Fish that live around coral reefs then have been found to have chemicals called mycosporines or mycosporine-like amino acids in their mucus. These chemicals block ultraviolet light. You're going to the beach, you put on sunscreen. They live there, they've already adapted to live there. Additionally, scales will overlap from head to tail and are the only attached at the front edge. Scales overlapping increases the mucus secretion and changes the composition when exposed to pathogens. Finally, mucus is studied for potential applications in human medicine and in aquaculture. They are trying to develop sunscreens for humans based on fish slime pretty neat. So where is fish slime found? Fish slime is found beneath the fish's slime coat, aka mucoprotein coating, on its scales. Beneath the epidermis of a fish is the dermis comprising fibrous connective tissue interspersed with black pigment cells. The vascular dermal tissues contain a network of capillaries, which brings blood and nutrients to the skin. Where is fish slime made? The structure and function reflect the adaptation of the organism to the physical, chemical, and biological properties of the aquatic environment and their natural history of the organism. Remember, we're seeing fish where they are evolved at this point. Who knows what they're going to be in 10,000 years, 100,000 years, 50 million years, or 3 billion years. We're just looking at them currently in geologic time. And they've had millions and millions, if not billions of years, to figure all this stuff out through chance mutations and the most fit ones surviving to pass the best protection on to their next generation. The dermis consists of a thick connective tissue made up of two basic layers. It is thicker and more stable than the epidermis. Fish skins have living cells. Mucus is produced by those goblet cells I mentioned earlier club cells, and saccaform cells found in the fish's epithelium. The skin of fishes, like that of all vertebrates, be it amphibians, reptiles, birds, 
or mammals, consists of two principal layers, the superficial epidermis. And remember, epi means above and derm means skin. It's the outermost layer. You also have the deeper dermis. You could call that a hypodermis, hypo for below, dermis for skin, below the skin. Now, the epidermis consists of two more additional layers. The deepest is a series called the germinal layer or stratum germinatavium. The outer cells are formed of its daughter cells. There is great variation in the outer cells between species. In humans, the cells are found in the mucous membranes that line your respiratory, intestinal, urinary, and reproductive passages. Body slimes are the product of the daughter cells and are continuously replaced. Usually, fishes with poorly developed scales are more slimy, and gill mucus secretion can remove fine particles of matter, preventing them from adhering in the gills. It's more functions of the slime. So you can have it on the outside of the skin. You can have it inside the gills as well. So what are some functions of fish slime? We already mentioned we're going to reduce the drag of the fish, regulate osmoregulation, protection, feeding, nest building, and chemical communication. Let's start with drag reduction. Slime reduces drag caused by the small spaces between scales and projecting body parts on a fish. Slime covers the irregular surfaces of the scales, enabling the fish to slip easily through its aqueous environment, which can reduce energy loss by up to 30%. Osmoregulation. In conjunction with the scales, it partially blocks the movement of water into and out of the fish's body. The slime helps maintain constant conditions or homeostasis inside the fish. Fish slime aids the balance of fish's essential electrolytes by forming a two-way selective surface that maintains a livable osmoregulatory filter. There are two trends that fish need to fight during osmoregulation. You may be familiar with these. One is water molecules moving from a concentration of less salt to an area with more salt. Think of a migrating fish, a fish that's going to go from fresh water to salt water. So smolting salmonids, be it uh, Pacific Coast salmon, it could be Atlantic salmon, it could be migratory steelhead, or shad smolts going out of fresh water into salt water. The other are salt ions moving from where they are more concentrated to where they are less concentrated. This would be the reverse. When salmonids stage and go through a metamorphosis before they enter fresh water, or the shad before they move up here into the brackish water. The shad in the Potomac don't get to go into purely fresh water. There's a physical geological barrier known as Great Falls that keeps them from getting up into the purely fresh water springs above there. But they're mainly in the brackish section around the fall line in Washington, D.C. Protection is the third function of fish slime. Slime enhances gas exchange efficiency across the surface when exchanging respiratory gases across the skin. Fish slime protects against abrasion. It protects against environmental toxins and heavy metal toxicity. Slime viscoelasticity determines its ability to block many types of motile bacteria in the water. Mucus traps pathogens. Those are microorganisms that cause disease. And antibodies, antimicrobial peptides, and enzymes in the mucus actively attack pathogens. When the old mucus layer containing all of those pathogens is shed, the fish will replace it with a new layer of mucus, and those pathogens are lost. So they gather them in the skin, and then at some point, the fish is going to shed that slime And maybe, hey, who knows? Maybe handling fish is doing them a benefit. Did you think about that? We might be removing pathogens from their skin. Mucus covers wounds caused by trauma or infection. Ammonia is a waste product of fish's digestion and respiration. It's a noxious chemical, and it's released in the water where the fish live. If the fish are in an area with high ammonia levels, like a fish farm, the fish are subject to ammonia burns, which disturb the slime coating and adversely affect the fish. Some fish slimes contain toxins that either immobilize their prey or give them protection from predators. Slime protects against surface invaders like fungi, 
bacteria, and ectoparasites. Slime contains medicinal qualities that are soothing to open wounds. Dirty Bill mentioned that getting fish slime on your hands sometimes will burn. So maybe that is the feeling of the disinfectant working on Dirty Bill's paws. I already mentioned that medical researchers are working to isolate slime's active ingredients to find applications for human infections and then further for sunscreens. Some examples of fish using slime for protection. Clownfish. They're also known as anemone fish because they can't survive without a host anemone. They don't produce their own protective coating. Clownfish gain their slime by rubbing against jellyfish or cnidarians. And you have two types of cnidarians. You have the free-floating ones, the medusa, and then attached with substrate, which are the anemones. So the anemones are going to have one to two clownfish in them, and they're gaining protection from the stinging cnidarian using its nematocyst to inject venom into whatever comes by. But then the fish is also going to hide in there. It's like a baby rhinoceros being hidden inside a thorn bush where lions and other big cats can't attack them because they're scared of the surrounding environment in which the prey item is being held. Lungfishes are one of the worst pets of all time. Trust me, don't get a lungfish for a pet. They produce a cocoon that allows them to survive drought. Their skin will secrete a mucosal cocoon to prevent them from becoming dehydrated during dormancy. The cocoon gradually hardens. The heart rate, blood pressure, and metabolic rate of the fish's metabolism decrease. This state of dormancy during hot and dry weather is known as estivation. Parrotfish. A parrotfish secrete a slime balloon around their bodies that alert them to the approach of potential predators. Just Google parrotfish slime balloon. It's pretty funky looking. The mucosal covering for the cocoon is secreted by the gill glands and released from the mouth of the fish. One way they use this is moray eel protection. Moray eels that taste the mucus will leave parrotfish alone in experiments. So these are reef fishes exposed at night, and they'll secrete these balloons and basically just hang out in them until morning. They may or may not eat them. I can't remember if I found that research. Now there's a catfish, specifically an Asian catfish, that has something called blind cells. They have no openings to the outside of the body involved in producing or storing alarm substances. However, when the skin is broken, these cells release a fright contagion that notifies others that something is going wrong. These substances are not necessarily species-specific. They are responsible for producing the fright syndrome that German aquarists refer to as Schreckstoff. The Mosasol is something I've known about since I was a kid. The research and discovery was done by a dear friend of the Snow White family named Jeannie Clark. You may know her as Eugenie Clark or the Shark Lady. She was the first person ever to hold the dorsal fin of a whale shark and hitch a ride, which is now highly frowned upon. So the Mosasol, and you can research this in the 1974 November issue of National Geographic, it features an article by Jeannie about the Moses soul in the Red Sea where she was doing research. My brother used to fly out there all the time with her to do research. He had a pretty cool upbringing. Now she demonstrated how the Moses soul slime contains a substance so effective in warding off sharks that the attacker's jaws are said to freeze in mid-bite and the shark won't eat them. Now, is this something that the fish is eating and producing like a monarch caterpillar or how a nudibranch might eat another nudibranch and the defense goes to its outermost layer, or is this something produced inside that fish's specific slime and it's a specific molecule that wards off the fish? That was pretty cool growing up with Jeannie as a friend of the family. We'd go see her do lectures, go to Smithsonian talks. I got to go to her lab when I was in high school. And one time, you know, I was playing with just jars and jars of dead sharks, but she had a whale shark embryo still attached to the, the egg case. I believe that was the second one ever found in nature. And I was there after school one day, just checking it out in a dissecting pan, looking at it. And that's the closest I've ever been to a whale shark. It's on my bucket list to go to Georgia to see one, but I don't know when I'm going to get to do that. So go look up Jeannie Clark. And if you can find her book, you're going to do yourself wonders by reading what the oceans were like nearly a hundred years ago. 
she was on the forefront of a lot of scuba diving stuff. And we miss her. She passed away several years ago, like five or six. The mandarin fish is the next one I'm going to talk about. It may be one of the most brilliantly colored fish in the world. I've seen them pickled at the Smithsonian in jars. And most fish, when you pickle them, are going to lose some of their pigment. You'll see this just when you take a Dorado out of the water, how quickly the colors change. If you ever catch a bluegill, those colors fade so quickly when you're removing the hook. It goes back in as a different colored fish. Well, this fish in a glass vial was probably the most brilliantly colored thing I've ever seen. The mandarins have a very heavy slime coat, which is why they smell bad. And then they taste bitter to help ward off predators along the reefs. Hagfish is the last one I'm going to talk about. These are disgusting. The most primitive fish out there. They look like an eel without a face. And they produce a toxin closely related to the lampreys, the pedromyzonids, that have ruined fisheries in the Great Lakes, immobilizing hosts on contact with their slimes. And these fish will also enter the vents of dead fish to eat them from the inside out. If you buy wallets and some leather products from Korea, you may be buying hagfish skin wallets. Additionally, they will secrete a terrible amount of mucus when you pull them out. If you get them in your net and throw them in a bucket, they will fill that bucket up within seconds of goo. And then they're going to turn their body into a knot and slide that knot lengthwise down from head to tail. And they're going to squeeze all of it off. Like you would take a piece of spaghetti and squeeze the butter off the noodle. They are disgusting fish. They're primitive and they can produce an inordinate amount of slime. Now, is that because they're the most primitive and they were the first to develop and that was their first line of defense? Most likely. The next up is feeding. Some fish secrete copious amounts of protein-rich slime as food for their offspring. The discus fish feed their young with body slime. They're classified in the genus Symphosodon and have beautiful colors and patterns. The slime develops on the sides of the parent fish at breeding time. This is not the same as lactation in mammals. The slime is different chemically, and there's not a permanent organized structure for secretion. It's not like, you know, they always have these boobs on the side of them, if you want to go with analogy. They just have these, these little uh, slime developing pores on the side, and they develop around breeding, and then they go away as they're needed. The fry feed on the skin mucus of their parents. The mucus is enriched with nutrients such as proteins and amino acids to support the young fish. Like mammalian milk, the mucus changes in composition as the young fish develop and continue to to fulfill their metabolic and dietary needs. The next fish that feeds with slime are wrasses. There's some funny names of wrasses out there. You can look those up. Rasses can produce a coagulating particle, which provides themselves with clean water in their immediate area, improving movement and dermal respiration. So if the water's cleaner with fewer particles around them, they can glide through the water faster. You think about all those old wooden boat hulls back in the day covered in barnacles that would slow them down tremendously. Well, fish can get slowed down too with all the parasites and other things on them. But if you're secreting and making clean water around you, you've got this kind of bulb of water around you that is cleaner and smoother to swim through and it's going to move with them some filter feeding fishes will pass the mucus forward into their mouths and eat it so some wrasse may eat this and then you have the tube lip wrasse which eats coral corals are pretty harsh organisms full of calcium carbonate and it also has stinging nematocysts So they're going to secrete slime to protect their mouth from eating the coral. It's pretty cool, right? Let's talk about nest building. Some fish are known to use slime to create nests for their young. Guaramis and betas specifically use slime in the construction of something called a bubble nest. The males will spit bubbles and keep the young safe inside until they're able to fend for themselves. If you purchase betta fish from the store and they're males and all of a sudden you've got a big pile of bubbles and that looks like frog spawn, he's just making a bubble from his labyrinth cells back in his mouth. Now, the last two parts are going to be communication amongst fish. This is going to be 
point seven A and point seven B. We're going to start off with communication amongst fish of the same species or intra-specific communication. Mucus cues can serve in communication among conspecifics or animals of the same species by attracting cues, enabling the finding of suitable habitats or partners or as alarm cues alerting to danger. Now, when I was doing my carp podcast, I spent weeks, if not months, tracking down how carp can warn each other of dangers by secretions. And I thought it was pheromones. So I looked up pheromones. I never really thought to look up fish slime produced warning mechanisms. And I had read this in a book somewhere and I was never able to back up the science. And now I think I'm sort of on the right track. There are skin odorant cues that are probably excreted through the fish mucus. And conspecific cues are known to enable different migratory fish species to find their habitats. Example, conspecific mucus trails enable suitable habitat finding of the waterfall climbing fish known scientifically as Sicyopteris strimpanzae or the Hawaiian goby or the Napoli rock climbing goby or the Upu Napoli or Stimson's goby. Chemical cues from conspecifics also play an important role in fish shoaling. Phosphatidylcholines are a major constituent of cell membranes. Skin mucuses have been found to induce school forming in young striped eel catfish. Plastomus linatus. And reproduction and male and female synchronizations of spawning also rely on the release of pheromones secreted through mucus in the water. Although pheromones are often released through urine, gill diffusion, or bile salts, some studies found several attractants can be found in fish skin mucus. It has been suggested that skin mucus amino acids from catfish, goldfish, and European eels could have a role in the social relationships of these species. Now, in contrast, researchers have found a high concentration of apolar, or having no electrical polarity, odorants in skin mucus of European eels, anguilla anguilla, which were not characterized, but their polarities suggest they could be sex steroids, prostaglandins, or related metabolites, indicating a possible role of fish mucus in the chemical communications of eel reproduction. Tetrodoxins, or TTX, have been found in fish mucus. They're also known to act as sex pheromones that attract males towards fertile females. Anyone remember that old movie, Love Potion Number 9? The release of alarm signals after injury is a widely reported mechanism in fish that produces an alarm response in conspecific fish with the ultimate objective of avoiding the source of danger. Could that be what the carp do? This may answer my question about carp secreting pheromones. 7b, interspecific communication, fish of a different species. Epidermal and gill mucus substances can act as infochemicals, infochemicals being chemical compounds that carry information and are employed by small organisms that cannot emit acoustic signals of optimal frequency to achieve successful communication. So if you're unable to make sound, you can communicate through smell. In different interspecific interactions, such as in prey-predator relationships, parasite-host interactions, and symbioses. Fish mucus molecules can be detected by a wide range of organisms and can generate different types of responses. Sea lice, again, we're getting into the detrimental effects of fish farming, Sea lice specifically locate and recognize their somatid hosts by chemo detection. And then you have the candiru catfish in the Amazon that parasitizes fish's gills and it recognizes that current and smell coming through a fish's gill where it's going to swim up and bite on and attach. Now, if you just happen to be the unsuspecting male urinating without clothes on in the Amazon waters, the stream of urine from your penis is the same current that comes out of that fish's gill that they parasitize. And you've seen this on several hospital shows where some dude's going to come in with a six inch long catfish that swam up their pee hole and is residing in their bladder. Look it up if you don't believe me. You also have tetrodoxins, 
These prevent the nervous system from carrying messages and thus muscles from flexing in response to nervous stimulation. They're actually produced by certain infecting or symbiotic bacteria like Pseudoalteromomus, Pseudomonas, and Vibrio, as well as other species found in animals from puffer fish that have been reported to repel predation by groupers. Caromonies are signal chemicals emitted by an organism which mediates interspecific interactions in a way that benefits an individual of another species which receives it and harms the emitter. Two main ecological cues are provided by caromones. They generally either indicate a food source for the receiver or the presence of a predator. You have nocturnal dial vertical migration, DVM and zooplankton. It's affected by uncharacterized caromones present in the mucus of planktivorous fish. So when you have zooplankton migrating up and down, they're going to go up to the surface at night to feed because that's where, you know, the food is. And when they get disturbed, they're going to light up. It's a chemical reaction with luciferin and luciferase. It's a biological glowing, basically. And when they get disturbed by small fish swimming through them, sure, a couple of them are going to light up and get eaten by the little fish. But the idea is if you make enough light and disturbance, the bigger fish are going to come and eat those little fish that are eating the plankton. So by sacrificing a select few of your own zooplankton or phytoplankton, you can then get your predators removed. And then the bigger fish don't care about the plankton. It's pretty cool. There's something called acropora corals, which use chemicals to attract gobies when attacked by toxic seaweeds. In turn, the gobies eat the seaweed and increase their own mucus toxicity, protecting them against predators and parasites. And there's a whole lot more about gobies. Gobies, they have a small range. The adult breeding pairs would be expected to avoid and benefit from maintaining healthy coral colonies. Accordingly, adult breeding pairs would be expected to avoid migrations and should benefit from maintaining those healthy coral colonies. Their adaptations include the possession of crinotoxic epidermal gland cells and a thick mucus epidermis instead of having scales. The compounds of their skin mucus are easily soluble in water and cause food refusal in predators and the avoidance responses in parasites. So they are not only going to clean the corals around them, they're going to produce toxins that prevent further coral from being eaten and also going to keep parasites off of them. The general mucus function as a predator parasite deterrent may also extend to the proximity of the inhabited colony. Combative behavior of gobies towards coralivores would be more effective if supplemented by such deterrent functions. Gobies of the genus Gobiodon, and their skin secrete a mucus that repels coralivores, organisms that feed on coral, protecting the coral from predation. Coral-dwelling gobies, then, can prevent the feeding behavior of obligate coralivores, such as butterfly fishes, which might individually consume up to three grams of coral tissue per day. Oddities. We're going to go through some weird things about fish. Some fish eat their own slime, and some cultures use that fish slime as effective glue. After researching this, I was then reading Kurlansky and came across this in one of his books. Let's go into some strange things about fish. Oddities. We know that some fish eat their own slime, but some cultures use fish slime as an effective glue. And I read that, and it sat on my computer for a while, but then I came across some information about that in in Mark Kurlansky's Gloucester book. Flaine created an enormous amount of scrap, skin and bones. The city began to complain about the scrap being dumped in the harbor, and finally, an ordinance was passed against it. The fishing industry started promoting the scraps as fertilizer, and one of their customers was a farmer named John S. Rogers, who noticed that his boots were getting stuck to the floor after working with the fish skins. Rogers was an amateur classicist, and he remembered that the ancient Greeks had made glue from fish skins, calling it Ichthyocola. The process had been lost. He experimented in his barn, as did a competitor named Stanward, buying all the skins left from the flame and producing successful glue companies. How about that? See, this stuff is pretty cool. I already mentioned the National Geographic article with Jeannie Clark. There's another National Geographic article titled Hagfish, aka Slime Eels Explode on Highway After Bizarre Traffic Accident. 
A truly sci-fi scenario, thousands of mucus-spewing hagfish destined for dinner plates in Asia coated a road in Oregon. So a truck carrying these hagfish flipped over and split open, and the slime absolutely covered the road. You could not drive on the road until it was all cleaned up. The northern snakeheads, I've talked a lot about their slime in recent podcasts. The second you pull them out of the water, they're gushing with ooey slime just to keep themselves from drying out. However, their mucus is used in the construction industry to increase the strength of mortar in Western India. Here's a cool fact you can share at a dinner party. Now let's talk about the detrimental effects if slime is removed. So we already know all about fish slime, where it's made, how different fish utilize it. But us as anglers, what happens after we've stressed the fish out? So the number one cause of deterioration in slime coat on fish is stress. So we've already hooked them, dragged them through the water, taken the hook out, probably dropped them, handled them, held them out of the water too long, probably dropped them going back in. They're not going back to their natural home. They're full of stress hormones and lactic acid. So what happens once that fish swims back to its hole or hiding spot and catches its breath? If the amount or quality of the slime changes, it affects the efficiency of gas transport through the skin. This makes the fish we catch vulnerable to diseases be it bacterial or fungal, fungal infections such as saprolaginia are the white filaments on an affected fish, which I think was what was in the picture posted by the outfitter or guide or shop in Colorado. You also have parasitic diseases. If you've ever caught a largemouth bass with black spots on it, this is a parasitic infection. There's a small parasite in that fish's skin, which is causing, I think, the skin to die around it, which causes it to turn black. I found the answer to this, which I've been wondering about for years, because we catch a lot of black spotted largemouth bass in the Potomac River. So this could be stress from just the fish in its environment, or it could be a fish that's been caught and released. So stress is the number one cause of deteriorated slime coats in fish, and fish lose electrolytes additionally from their body into the surrounding waters. So we're affecting the internal and external chemical environment of the fish. I don't know how long it takes for those fish to reproduce that slime to start protecting itself again. And I don't know how long it takes in general to produce slime. And that is the conclusion of my podcast. I hope you thought this was interesting. I just wanted to research fish slime and find out if handling fish really is that bad. And yes, it is. And we found out some cool, interesting stuff on the way. So please share this podcast with someone else. They don't have to be a fly angler. It could be a biology teacher or professor It can be to a friend, whatever. Just let them know you learned some pretty cool information about fish slime on this podcast. Thank you for listening to this podcast. I look forward to hearing questions and comments from you in the future. And again, if you want the notes and sources from this podcast, because I'm not publishing this, I don't have to worry about copyright infringement. You can send me an email, rob at robsnowwhite.com, and I will send you a Word document. Thanks again, and I appreciate you taking the time out of your day to listen to my podcast. Jason and I, thank you. Thank you for joining us for the Fly Fishing Consultant Podcast. For more information or to contact Rob, please go to www.robsnowwhite.com. This podcast is brought to you by Freestone Productions at freestoneproductions.com.